Joy J. Moore here. It's a thrill when I get to meet podcast listeners and realize that we're connected through the Sermon Brainwave podcast. Some tell me that they feel like they're active participants in the discussions that Caroline, Matt, Rolf, and I have about biblical text. Or if you're a narrative lectionary podcast li listener, those conversations that Rolf, Craig, and C Catherine have around the narrative text. It's a reminder that all of us who preach are partners in this great calling to declare the good news, especially during difficult times. And here we are in the final weeks of the Working Preacher Spring Fund campaign. We're getting close to meeting our $50,000 goal. If you or a preacher you know relies on Working Preacher, now is the time to give your financial support. Thank you. Thank you more than ever for your support for this ministry. Go to workingpreacher.org slash donate and give today. Help keep Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. This is the podcast for Holy Trinity Sunday, 2021. And the first reading is Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. The psalm is number 29. The second reading is Romans 8, 12 through 17. And the gospel is John 3, 1 through 17, which I feel like we just had like a week ago. I think it was, I think it was two weeks ago, but yeah, yeah you're about right. <laughs> yeah, here we, here we go. And I imagine it's because of, we've got the spirit mentioned here uh, and Jesus is talking and there's a reference to God. So we've got the Trinity covered, but here is what I'm thinking about uh, for this passage. And that is the way in which we because the, the hard thing, right, is always how the over explanation of the Trinity or how do we talk about that without going into um, endless uh, doctrinal discussions about who the Trinity is and what the Trinity does and dancing and perichoresis and all kinds of things. Uh, and, you know, what is there a way into it that's a little bit, I don't know, something different. So, uh, what is interesting about this passage, this is, this is kind of where I was going, is that you have two references to the kingdom of God here uh, in verses three and then uh, uh, verses three and five. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And then, uh, and then again in verse five, very true, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. So Jesus is trying to communicate, of course, to Nicodemus that this and what she misunderstands is that this is a, a what he's offering is a birth from God, referring back to John 1, 12 through 13. Uh, but what's interesting about this is that we're used to this phrase of kingdom of God from the synoptics, but this is the only time it occurs in John is in chapter three. Now in chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus says, my kingdom, but not kingdom of God. So what if the Trinity, what if the kingdom of God becomes, uh, or the Trinity here, I'll put it this way, that the Trinity becomes a way to imagine what the kingdom of God is. Uh, that, you know, there's a lot of ways to think about the kingdom of God, and we're going to get that starting next week, right, with, with back in Mark, uh, and describing what the kingdom of God is with parables. But what if the, that the Trinity, it becomes this lens through saying, this is what the kingdom of God is about. This is what the kingdom of God is. It's about relationship and about um, interconnectedness. That's my idea for Trinity Sunday. It's also about the presence of God among us. Right? Yeah. So you've got a lot of language here about, well, at least with regard to Jesus as the son of man who descends and reascends um, and this idea of being born from above and participating in that. I mean, for me, this is a, a way of speaking about the Trinity, not as some 
ideal or some theological idea that we need to make sure we every, everybody understands so we don't embarrass ourselves so we can explain this you know to our muslim neighbors or things like that but rather to think about the ways in which our experience of god is deeply historical is deeply personal whatever um and but also deeply geared toward community and toward a vision for the future and all of this is experienced in flesh and blood and experienced in real life um and this seems a good passage to start to pull us into that with not just some reassurance but also a whole lot of wonder and confusion <laughs> Do you know well, what I mean? It's both an invitation, yeah. but it's also, you feel for poor Nicodemus, like what in the world is he talking about? Um, yeah. And he should, but because you need to then step into the story to get a deeper sense of what, um, what Jesus is trying to introduce here. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it puts some flesh on this, on the Trinity, <laughs> if, you know, every pun intended. Okay, um, now I, I have to jump in. You just gave me the perfect entree for what I've been waiting to say. What's that? Well, I mean, so um, I want to, I'm going to read without quoting because I don't have the per permission, but um, our, our graduating students who are Lutheran have to write this set of essays in order to get ordained. And uh, the first question in the new set of questions for these has to do with the Trinity. And so suddenly we're getting in the last few years, all these mini essays on the Trinity, some of which are uh, just brilliant. And one of them I love this that one of our students wrote recently, and I cannot quote her by name, but she wrote, in three persons, God stepped out of eternity and into human history to interrupt the course we had set for ourselves. Mm. I, I thought that was so beautiful that in three persons, mm. God stepped out of eternity and in, into human history, there's God in the flesh, incarnate, Yeah, yeah. obviously in the second person, to interrupt the course we had set for ourselves, um, a course that ran counter to the one God had intended, so that um, the Trinity is, uh, the second thing I wanted to say then is that, so the first thing then, there is a connection with the incarnation. It's through the power of the spirit that Jesus is incarnate, and it's through the power of the spirit that Jesus remains um, present with us. Uh, but the, the second thing I wanted to say is that the, the Trinity, uh, the Trinity is the way the church came up with to assert that God is, has always been the same and that the God um, of the Old Testament is not a different God or that there are three gods, but rather that God has always been the same and that that God is consistent with the, uh, the event of Jesus Christ, this, this event in which we experienced God's presence in Jesus. So the, that helped me a lot is to mm -hmm. figure out that the, that's the, the reason for Trinitarian theology was to assert those two things. God was present in Jesus and consistent with the God of the Old Testament. Mm. Good. Sorry, sorry. I, uh, you, you've uh, presented with that incarnation I thing. I did, uh, yeah. Uh, a way for me to get that quotation mm -hmm. in, which I thought mm -hmm. was so powerful. Yeah, that's great. So sorry, you, but you were going on, but now I probably threw you off course. No, I know that I think that's part of what we get in the John. Uh, it's a significant aspect of what we get here in John on Trinity Sunday is this, you know, with water and spirit and birthing um, this, this, in, this enfleshed idea of, of what the Trinity is. And going back to my earlier comment about the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is um, not a, a place or a thing, but a relationship and community and uh, dependence uh, and uh, and new creation. So I, yeah, I think it, it all connects. So what's Good. the promise then, Caroline? There, uh, what's the promise for people in John here when it says, you must be born from above, born of the spirit, and you are born of the spirit mm -hmm. uh, in baptism. So uh, what is the promise for daily life then in there other than you know to say you've, you've already been born of the spirit? Yeah, well, for John, it that the it goes back to one twelve to thirteen that you are born children of God, um, not of man, but of the will of God, and so it it really and it 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 is locating uh, what God is doing in Jesus is this invitation into a kind of intimate relationship of dependence and belonging and trust. 
uh, just as a child uh, would trust uh, a parent. And so that's not, you know, that, that language in John in the prologue is not, is not, it's not theoretical. It becomes, it gets developed then throughout, uh, through John 1, 18, no one has ever seen God. It is this unique God, begotten God who is at the father's breast, John 13, 23, the beloved disciples at the breast of God. And so that's, that's part of what I mean about, you know, being a citizen in the kingdom of God, that it's, that it's, uh, it starts with, um, it starts with being in this relationship that is shared between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that gets then developed throughout the Gospel of John, which is totally uh, almost impossible to get your head around. <laughs> but that's the process. But that's the that's the promise. But that's the point. Maybe our point is not to understand the Trinity that and and to come up with answers about what it is. The point is to uh, is to uh, see where we experience it um, and what it what it actually feels like to be a part of this intimate relationship that has been, as you said, from the very beginning. I saw that Rolf snuck a baptism reference in there. You didn't correct him. That was, we're, we're, we're growing, we're making progress. Yeah, not for John, but that's okay. <laughs> how, about, um, how about Isaiah 6, 1 through 8? Is there, there's no baptism in this. And there's no trinity in this. Should we move on? <laughs> yeah, I I had a hard time deciding what how, what I would do with this on Trinity Sunday. To be perfectly honest, well, you play the hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God. Okay, it's really hard to sing, but it, we need to pick up the pace a little bit. Yeah, you're right. If, if it's an entrance hymn, let's go, people. Yeah, let's go. Why did, why did you start so slow, Rolf? Okay. Right. So, yeah, it's got to be. Uh, it's got to be. It's got. Holy yeah, holy. kind of jazz it up, swing it, make it swing. Uh, I. So I confess to lo loving this passage. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible, and uh, it really doesn't fit on Trinity Sunday. <laughs> um, I suspect that the reason it's here is the old view uh, that, um, well, let me just point, uh, focus in on a, a thing that has bothered interpreters over the years, that when God speaks, so there's the Lord, Isaiah has a vision of the Lord, there's two seraphs, angels who take the form of uh, snakes with three sets of wings, don't get weirded out, that's, what, that's how they thought about the seraphs, um, and, uh, and then God says, um, I have to find the place in the text uh, where it, where uh, I can't see it. Verse eight. Whom, thank you. Uh, whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? The I and the we, what's that about? What's the us? Um, so in, uh, in old views that have been discredited by scholarship are, it's the royal we, uh, but uh, there's no place in the ancient Near East or in the Bible where uh, a, a, a king or queen ever speaks with the royal we, so we know that can't be right. The second is the Trinity. It's the Trinity who is the us. And then I recently saw, even that was an argument uh, that a recent person used uh, in our church uh, for a particular way of speaking about God wrong. It's not the Trinity. It is rather the what's called the sowed, the, the holy council, uh, the, the angelic beings, so which would include the seraphim and the cherubim and other angels around God. So, uh, so God is deliberating with them. And so if it's not the Trinity, then what is, and then, then what is this text doing here? I don't know, but I love the text. It's the call. If you want to preach on call uh, and how the spirit calls us, this is a great text. Well, I would take this text and and probably speak a little bit less about God and a more about and a little bit more about Isaiah. Uh, I was taken by something that Julie Clausens mentions in her commentary when she's referring to Kathy Carruth and the, the notion of of Isaiah's response to the vision of being utterly possessed or haunted by his experience of God, mm. and to think about. Uh, well, to put ourselves in Isaiah's sandals for a moment and think, what would it mean to go through some kind of an experience like this? <laughs> what would that do to a person? How would that change you? 
how would that change uh, the way you sleep at night and what you think about when you wake up in the morning? Partly just to get into the weirdness of this whole thing and, and the terror of, of the experience, but also to say, how do we respond with the idea of a God who comes near? What, how do we respond to this idea of being called by God? And, and it's, so, it's become so familiar to us with language, well, around baptism or around John three or anything like that, but to, to say, how does, not that we're going to ever understand the Trinity, but to understand God coming near to us and forgiving us or summoning us, like, how does that change a person? And just spend a little bit of time with that so that when we think about Trinity Sunday, it's not, how can we all understand this better so that we can represent our doctrines well? But it's just a pause before we jump into ordinary time and say, um, what is this doing to our, to our minds, to our sense of reality, to our, our hopes and dreams and fears? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe it's a little too touchy-feely for Trinity Sunday, but that's what I would do. Well, I, I love the, I, I mean, the, the dimension of the text of being terrified by the call of God. Be mm -hmm. terrified by the presence when when I uh, you know when Isaiah shouts out woe to me right even and even the cry of the seraphims holy 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 it's a cry of dismay or just uh, of utter it's less a cry of worship than it is a cry of of uh, intensity God's presence is so intense uh, you know the, uh, uh, that it does create a sense of terror in Isaiah at being called. I think that's really worth pointing out uh, mm -hmm. because, as you notice, it's so it is so counterculture to our vocational call. Everybody's called, yeah. So, yeah. I would say the same thing about Psalm twenty nine uh, this what is week. It doing here? Um, yeah, I mean, although okay. this one at least it is the sense of the experience of transcendence here uh, in nature in creation that ties back to psalm 104 uh, if people are interested uh, you know you do have the you know the sense of the spirit but the, but a sense of uh experience that moment especially at that moment when you're out in creation of the uh, utter transcendence of god i know matt i met i know matt you were taken by that yeah that's part of you know, uh, I think it's how we're supposed to respond to Trinitarian theology. I know there are people out there who have fought over this and fought over definitions and probably people who lost their lives or their reputations because they, they had crazy new ideas about the Trinity. So I don't want to diminish that, but I, I do think that the purpose of the Trinity, or I'm sorry, the purpose of preaching about a Trinitarian God on Trinity Sunday is probably less about explaining. And I'm all for explaining. I get paid to explain stuff. That's part of my job. But it's more to be caught up into wonder mm -hmm. of this idea. Just because we can name some of these things doesn't mean we can grasp the divine. And so to be struck by the utter transcendence of God is not a bad thing to do. Or to And, you know, so a sermon that ends with not a shrug of the shoulders, but a but a sense of, oh, I don't know, like Carl Bart talks about, you know, exegesis being about something like trying to, you know, trying to capture all of the ocean with a, with a cup or something like that. You know, it's, it's that kind of a feeling. And so to pull people into that, which gives people space, not just for the fear of Isaiah, but for this, it gives people space to wonder uh, and to be free and not to be afraid of making a mistake about the nuances of their theology, lest the pastor get mad at them, you know, but, but to call people into depths and this is Psalm 29 in that regard is great for that. And that the response to that is worship. You know, what, what do you, what do you do? Um, that's, I think where the Psalm is helpful in, in, well, what do we do with this awesomeness? What do we do with this glory and this splendor and wonder uh, and transcendence? Uh, you worship. And, and so the, it, the Psalm calls us into that response uh, of not finding an answer or finding explanation, but you, you simply um, gather and worship. This. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, uh, Holy Trinity is the first Sunday of ordinary time. So the connection of the Trinity and the spirit with the ordinariness of life. And uh, 
Although the, the moment kind of described paradigmatically in Psalm 29 is not an ordinary moment. It's one of those, uh, here's a $10 word, theophanic moments, right? Uh, the moment when you feel God's presence intensely, but that happens out in the ordinary. It happens in daily life. Uh, in this case, in a thunderstorm, in other cases, in, in a sunrise or a sunset or uh, or while stopping on a, a student of mine, uh, said she and her mother were on a, on a walk. And she said, for her, for me, the point of a walk is to get to the destination. But for my mother, it's to stop and, and notice some incredibly beautiful little thing in nature. And she says, I'm trying to learn to appreciate that because I just want to get down at the walk. But my mom stops and sees these beautiful things everywhere. And um, that sort of stuff is, you know, it's like the fingerprints of God that, that, uh, or the voice of God as the Psalm says. But let's go to Romans eight. So Matt uh, last week talked about, maybe you flip them and preach last week on uh, this part of Romans eight and today on last part of Romans eight. But let's assume people didn't do that. And so now we've got 20, 12 through 17. Uh, what, what's the spirit doing here? What, what verbs of the spirit are we noticing? Hmm. Uh, well, it, it bears witness, you know, it, it, it bears witness with our spirit, with our soul, with ourself that, that we're children of God. And so, you know, even it, it's, it's kind of a weird, it's not, it's not a proof, right? Paul says, even our ability to call God Abba is a means by which the spirit bears witness to our adoption as children of God. Now, don't treat Abba as like daddy and jesus was the first person to use this to describe god or things like that you know there's some old there's some some views even, even my dog's getting distressed about misuse of abba but it's this idea that we too now can boldly refer to god as a parent uh just as jesus did and the spirit is the means by which um we we uh that we do that and that notion of adoption we've talked about in years past is incredibly powerful Probably in any culture in, in the Greco-Roman world, it had a whole lot of stuff tied to it in terms of honor and and um, um, and privilege. Um, in just terms stop, of stop right there. Just take 90 seconds and unpack that, Matt. Unpack. Okay, you're not a citizen or something, and you're just uh, either a slave or a free person in Rome, and you get adopted into a household. Take 90 seconds and explain why that's so powerful. 90? All right. Yep. Start the clock. Okay, go. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to steal now from Sarah Rudin and her book, Paul Among the People, which is a, a must buy for people looking for something to read. It's about 10 years old. Um, she talks about how one of the literary tropes in the ancient world, in popular literature, were um, these adoption fantasies similar to how we have like lottery winning fantasies in our culture, right? A bunch of, bunch of, bunch of working class folks, you know, get together and pool lottery tickets and make like hundred million dollars where they get, you know, it's just, so there were these, these adoption fantasies about ordinary folks getting adopted by a, a senatorial class family or something like that. It was this way of delighting people in a kind of like slumdog millionaire kind of way where you have these stories all over the place, right? What if an ordinary person got the, got the ticket to the good life and in a sense that's what paul's doing here right it wasn't that a ton of people would get like legally adopted this is usually the stuff that's going on among the citizenry or or you know um uh julius caesar adopts octavian as his son i mean there's all sorts of ways in which it was meant to ensure the passing on of honor and of wealth and of status to a person you would select don't like your kids that's fine adopt somebody you prefer <laughs> And make sure everything flows through that person. You know, I mean, it had political, it had particular political advantages for some people in certain aspects of life. Now, to say that the God of the universe does that, and that the God of the universe does that with you, and that you now become a joint heir alongside of Christ, is really a remarkable statement that Paul's making here in terms of your own value, each of you as an individual. That was probably more than 90 seconds. Actually, you know what? It was, every second was uh, fantastic. Thanks. I mean, because right, that sort, that sort of example, I think, preach, it preaches homiletically. I mean, people can understand that. 
Yeah. You know, um, I well, and you you reminded us uh, from preaching last week on Pentecost, Rolf, of paying attention to the verbs. What does the Spirit do? And I uh, and and what I hear is verse 14, for all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. Uh, and uh, that, you know, that, that, that promise of, um, that promise of that leading, I think is also, uh, I think also could be powerful for uh, people to, the, you know, we are, we are children of God uh, and we are led by God. We are led by God and therefore we are children of God. I mean, there's that interconnectedness, but, but that, uh, that promise, especially moving into uh, post-pandemic reality and into ordinary time to trust that leading, uh, to trust that, uh, that, that, that bringing and that going is, you know, our other possible translation of, of Ago. And so that we, that we, that, that we trust that. I think that's a, I think that's another place that I, I hear the promise of the spirit's presence um, to, to follow. And um, maybe that's, that's what we, that's what we do. Uh, yeah, and, with... fo and following up briefly on that, and then to live in the spirit. I mean, so as, as, as ordinary time starts, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit, you put the deeds to us, you will live. So being led by the spirit is to live in the spirit uh, and to trust then all of the spirits, um, all of those verbs uh, that by which the spirit leads and in, in which we live.